Hi everyone, uh, I'm Esther. I'm part of the NATA Singapore Women's Everest team. So back in 2004, my team had a single-minded plan, and that was to send the first Singaporean women uh, to the top of the world, or more specifically for us, to the summit of Mount Everest. So even though there's just one of me here today, there were five others who formed the team with me and walked this journey of five years together with me to the top of the world. Um, you may not be able to tell from this picture, but all of us come from very different walks of life. Some of us are in the financial sector, some I'm in advertising, some of us are educators, and there's one of us whom no one messes around with. She's actually a major in the Singapore Armed Forces. <laughs> I'll leave you to guess which one is that. <laughs> So when we first came back to Singapore from Everest, the most common question we got was, how do you get to Everest from Singapore, a relatively flat city, concrete jungle, to literally the top of the world? See, if you compare it side by side, um, <laughs> Singapore, the coldest you will get is probably in this room, 18 degrees <laughs> Celsius, it's air conditioned, and the kind of great winds that you experience is probably when you're driving on the expressway, speeding at 120, degree, 120 kilometers per hour, and with the windows wound down, the kind of wind speeds. And we generally have two types of weather. Uh, one is hot and humid, and the other is wet and humid. So on Everest, it's a very different story. Uh, wind speeds can be easily 200 kilometers per hour, and wind speeds nearer the summit have been known to be able to blow climbers off the track. And the kind of temperatures that we get on Everest would be easily minus 40 degrees Celsius, anything above Camp 3. And the weather is unpredictable, totally unpredictable. You can go to bed with clear skies in your tent. Um, and when you wake up the next morning, you won't be able to open your tent at all because you, you could have been snowed in from an overnight uh, snowstorm. So to put things in perspective, uh, I'm just going to show you a very simple graph. So what's the highest point in Singapore we have here? <coughs> Some of you might know, we have our very own Bukit Timah Hill, standing at 164 meters. <laughs> That's right. And the buildings we have here are actually taller than our natural landforms. So we have the tallest building in Singapore, UOB Plaza, at 280 meters. <laughs> And just last year, uh, in Dubai, that was erected the world's highest building, um, and it stands at 828 meters. And towering above all of these is Mount Everest, 8,850 meters. And that's more than 10 times the tallest building in the world. And how do we get ready for a goal that is so huge and so beyond, seemingly beyond our grasp? We may not have mountains in our backyard. We had to think creatively how we're going to train for Everest. We know we are pretty flat here, but we do have tons of high-rise buildings. <laughs> so every week you will find us uh, at this particular um, public housing block, 30 stories. We'll put on a heavy backpack of about 20 kg and also ankle weights of about 5 kg. And we'll go up and down, up and down this building for about uh, two to three hours. So that's about maybe 10 to 12 sets. Uh, the, ankle, the ankle weights we have there are to simulate the actual weight of the mountaineering boots that we would we'll be wearing on Everest. So when we first started uh, on this public housing block, uh, a lot of residents thought that the lift has spoiled. <laughs> so we tried to assure them, no, it's not. We're just training for the mountains. And do you know what's the most agonizing part about stair climbing? It's not uh, the physical training. It's not the boredom. It's actually the smells of the food that comes from the various households <laughs> as we go up and down this, this building. We'll be training after work in the evenings on an empty stomach, and then we'll be smelling things like chicken curry, fried rice, and that was sheer agony for us. All of us love food a lot. So on top of staircase training, we, also have, uh, we are also at Bukit Timah Hill every weekend doing the circuits with a heavy backpack for about three to four hours. We couple that with um, technical rope Road work training, and also once a month we squeeze in a sleep deprivation training. Sounds insane, but it actually makes a lot of sense on Everest because on a typical summit day, climbers can be um, climbing for about 24 hours non-stop. So we have to expose ourselves to this kind of long hours of physical endurance. So if you add up all that I've just told you, everything that I've just told you, and you throw in maybe one or two long runs of about 10 to 20 kilometers every week, and also gym work, we're actually training about six times a week on top of our full-time jobs. Sometimes I wonder how we did that. So on top of our local, tra 
uh, training, we also had to expose ourselves to actual mountaineering conditions out there. This is why we had this five-year plan. Um, we, every year, we aim to climb a, climb a mountain of increasing altitude. So, and this, our journey has brought us to various parts of the world, such as Mera in the Himalayas, uh, Mustak Atta at the China-Pakistan border, Choyu in Tibet, before we finally got to Everest in Nepal. And every year, on top of these major expeditions, uh, we also throw in like ice climbing training and smaller peaks that we can afford. So it looks like a pretty good plan, right? Our five-year journey. Do you know what was the, common, the most common reaction we got from people when we first showed them this plan? We felt like instant stand-up comedians. <laughs> because people would laugh at us. It's unfathomable that six young girls want to go to the top of the world. And when the most common question we got us, um, do you plan on going to Everest Base Camp? And we'll go like, no, we plan to go to the top of the world, like right to the peak. And we could almost see like speech bubbles forming from their heads, like seemingly asking, why can't you girls fit the typical female profile? Stay at home, wash your clothes, cook your meals. By the way, this is an actual picture of us at Everest Base Camp wash, doing our dirty laundry. And the same basins that we use to wash our dirty laundry are the very same basins we use to wash our vegetables for our meals. <laughs> so that's how scarce resources are out there. So even right from the beginning, we knew that ours was an uphill task. We realized that convincing people that want to climb Everest is a hard thing. And asking people for money to climb Everest is even harder. And Everest is not a cheap mountain to climb. It costs 10,000 US dollars just for one climbing permit for one climber to climb above base camp. And there are six of us. And on top of that, we throw in costs like communications, like logistics. So we have a pretty big bill to pay. And I think the darkest period of the team's journey was when we had to postpone our climb. We didn't plan to climb Everest in 2008. We planned to, uh, we, we planned to climb Everest in 2008, not 2009. But when 2008 came along, we realized that we don't have enough money. We don't have enough sponsors who are willing to give us money to climb. And we, a lot of self-doubt started coming in, you know, we started to think about, are, our cynics, are the cynics correct? Maybe we can't, we, maybe we can't pull this off. And on, we, now that we have the benefit of hindsight, I think that the postponement was actually a very good wake-up call for all of us. Because we realized that we cannot, um, we have to take the fundraising, uh, the fundraising role upon ourselves on top of our six-day-a-week training and full-time jobs. So all of us became, we became PR people for the team. We made cold calls. We squeezed ourselves into every networking session that we could. And we bugged secretaries to secure appointments just so that we can meet their bosses and make our sales pitch to them. And when we finally raised enough money to climb Everest in 2009, we faced challenges of a different sort. You see, when we got to Everest, we felt like we were in the Lord of the Rings movie. We were the hobbits next to the six, the, the, the two meter tall, mainly male Caucasian climbers. We literally looked like hobbits next to them. And when we were higher up on the mountains on camp three and four, a lot of these climbers, they came up to us and they were very surprised. They asked, I thought you girls were staying at base camp. And we go like, no. And they go like, please be careful because it's a dangerous place for young girls like you. And, <laughs> and we can totally understand what, where they're coming from. Um, this is Everest Base Camp. You can see the colorful tents in the foreground. And just above Everest Base Camp, that's called the Kumbu Ice Fall. It's a huge expanse of glacier, of constantly moving glacier. And my team leader likes to call this the front row seats to a horror movie. Why? Because when you take a close-up view at the Kumbu Ice Fall, this is us treading through the millions of ice blocks there. Small as, the smallest can be as small as a pebble. The biggest can be as large as a double-decker bus. And when we go through the Kumbu Ice Fall, all of us, there's a grave silence that just falls over all of us. We just climb quickly as we can and quietly, just so we can hear out for noises of um, rumblings underground and all that. Even our Sherpas start chanting their prayers under their breath, and that's when we know we better hurry up. <laughs> and um, dangers on, on, on the Kumbu Ice Fall include avalanches and also crevasses. Crevasses are like huge gaping holes in the icy ground. And to get across a crevice, you have to use ladders. So this is us practicing at base camp, uh, because as they forgot, Singaporeans, we are not afraid to over-prepare. So we we're doing a lot of practice at Everest base camp. And it, it, it may look easy, but it's actually very tricky to go across a crevice on a ladder. 
because we don't just wear boots. On our boots are strapped crampons, and crampons are actually metal spiky bits so that to attach to our boots so we can gain traction on the icy ground. And to maneuver those spiky bits on the rungs of the ladder is not easy. So we kept practicing at base camp um, on these so that we can be ready for something like this, an actual open face crevice. And that's me going up uh, this section. Crevices can be horizontal and deep, like this one. It can also be vertical, like this one. And this is a triple ladder section where we literally strap three lengths of ladder to get to the top of this ice block. And if you think that it looks harrowing from the picture, I can tell you that it's much worse in real life. <laughs> because, like I mentioned, weather on Everest is unpredictable. When you first start climbing up on this ladder, it's stationary, and the wind comes, and it sways the ladder, and you along with it. And sometimes when you look down, you realize that um, sometimes climbers going up this route, they're not careful, so the, the crampons on their, on their boots will then start poking holes into the ladder rungs. So when you look down, you look like you you look, you're looking at metal Swiss cheese full of holes. You're just hoping that you're not going to be creating another hole in this ladder, in, in this ladder rung. And I cannot, I mean, I, I, I've lost count on the number of times I've told God, like, please don't let me go up this Kumbu ice wall again. But by the time my team and I have submitted Mount Everest, uh, all of us have gone up and down this Kumbu ice fall no less than eight times. And that's because for, for, for an Everest climb, you can't just go from like base camp uh, all the way to the top. There are actually four campsites, and you have to go through this process called acclimatization. Acclimatization is necessary because you have to trick your bodies into producing more red blood cells so you can cope the very thin oxygen up there. And so this is why the Everest climb took two and a half months. So from base camp, we'll go to camp one, come down, base camp, camp one, camp two, come back down. Then base camp, camp one, camp two, camp three, come back down. And that's when we are ready for the Everest summit push. So by the time we actually step on the summit, we have climbed the mountain at least three times. Mm -hmm. And there are not a lot of details I can go into today, but I, I would like to tell you that despite all the disbelief and all the laughter, my team's story is, is, has got a happy ending. So last year in May, uh, we managed to put not one, but five Singaporean women on the top of Mount Everest. And if you have any questions about the view, this is it. This is taken right from the very uh, summit of Everest as the sun rose in the background. So that's the shadow of Everest uh, that look overlooking the other mountains. And this view, um, a backstory would be like, we took five years of training, two and a half months on the mountain, and 20 minutes on the summit. <laughs> so people will be asking, is it worth it, seriously? And we'll be like, on hindsight, yes, definitely. Because we realized that when we first started out, Everest is a physical mountain for us, 8,850 meters. But along the way, Everest became different things. It became the fundraising challenge. It became the need to convince people that we are serious about doing this. It became the courage to tell people in the face, no, we're not going to base camp, we're going to the very top. And I believe that to you, Everest is yours to define. It could be a career goal, it could be a sporting achievement, but it could even be a lifelong mountain to climb, like making a marriage work. And sometimes you're going to feel like it's not worth it. Sometimes we felt like to, and we felt like giving up. But with the benefit of hindsight now, I can tell you that it is worth every painful step. And just to round things off, we just want to share with you a quote from the founder of Outward Bound, Kurt Hunt. There is more in us than we know. If we can be made to realize this, perhaps for the rest of our lives, we will never be able to settle for less. Thank you.